Well, hello everyone, and uh, thank you for coming today. Uh, my name is Dr. Kate Barlow, and I am the CDC's Act Early Ambassador for the state of Massachusetts. Uh, by discipline, I am an occupational therapist, so I do have experience in pediatrics, actually 20 plus years, and 12 of those are in a public school preschool. Um, since I have moved back uh, to Massachusetts in 2015, I've been working in early intervention since 2016. Uh, one day a week. I uh, work as a feeding consultant. And I am so excited to share that this school year I am working two days a week in the Holyoke Chicopee Springfield Head Start on a grant. So I am thrilled um, to be able to uh, be working in Head Start this year. So this um, presenta presentation today, if you have any questions, just go ahead and ask. This is for you. So it can be as informal as you want. So just go ahead and say, Kate, I have a question and we will answer it right then and there. So the first thing that we're gonna do is we are going to take a poll. Okay, so our first um, thing I wanna talk about is really what is Learn the Signs Act Early? And it's a program to really improve early identification of children with developmental delays and autism. And it's really about parent engagement. So how can we promote the parents to really monitor their own child's development? And then this in turn will then facilitate uh, early action on those concerns. Why is this important? Because about one in six children has a developmental disability between the ages of three and 17. And then for ages birth to five, it's one in four children that are at a moderate or high risk for a uh, developmental behavioral or social delay. But for me, working in early intervention, what's most concerning is that more than half of the children in that birth to three population are not participating in early intervention. So really we're missing half of the children that need services are not getting them. And so how can we really close that gap? How can we really reach those children to get them the services they need as early as possible? Because we know that the sooner children receive services, the better the outcomes for the children. What's really disturbing though, is that children with autism spectrum disorder are still not being identified until age four. This is from the CDC, even though we know parents are noting concerns around 18 months. So the sooner that children are identified, the sooner they get the services. So this is really what Learn the Signs Act Early is all about. The mission of the program is really, again, just that parent engaged developmental monitoring because you're already doing screening at Head Start, right? I'm an occupational therapist. They come to me, they've already been identified. They're at EI, they've already been identified. You're doing the screening at Head Start. So what can we do? We can get the parents involved in the community and then hopefully improve the amount of early identification um, within, the within the community. So if we get parents involved and parents are, you know, on the app, it's a free app, right? They're using these free monitoring tools um, to watch their own child's development, then hopefully it'll really close that gap. So the Learn the Signs Act Early Approach it's really, it's positive, it's friendly, it's parent focused, um, it's evidence based, it's, it's written out of language, uh, uh, I believe around the fourth grade level. Uh, the materials come in six languages on the site to really um, be able to reach more populations. And I have other languages that you can email me for that aren't necessarily CDC approved, but we've had someone translate. So you can always reach out um, if there's a language that you need. But really, it's it's the attack. It's not a scare tactic, right? We know from research that if we like, oh, I think something's wrong with your child, that that scare tactic doesn't really work, and that parents are less inclined to go see the doctor. So instead, we want to celebrate miles. We want to use this as a communication tool. Oh my goodness, I saw you know Johnny pull to stand in class today. That's so wonderful. That's one of the gross motor milestones for nine months. You know what I haven't seen though is really waving bye bye or clapping hands. I haven't seen that. Are you seeing that at home? So it's really used as a communication tool, and it's about celebrating their milestones more so than um, you know scaring parents that there's something wrong with their child. 
So how the Learn the Signs Act Early program works is that every state and some of the US territories has an ambassador. So that's me from Massachusetts. And what we do is we really try to get everyone using the same tool. Wouldn't that be great, right? How many people use a different screening tool or a different assessment? So can we all use this one tool to really use that same language for developmental monitoring? So I have an intern working um, in pediatricians offices and I'm really focusing on Head Start and EI. And you know, in other um, states, the ambassador is really working with DCF or home visiting. So um, depending on the background of the um, ambassador is really where their focus is, but the goal is to really have these partnerships across the spectrum for everyone that works with children. So developmental monitoring is not the same as screening. And this is a really important concept because um, we're trying to include developmental monitoring with developmental screening. They do not replace each other at all. In fact, the research has shown that if they are, if, when we are doing both developmental monitoring with screening, that is when we have the best outcomes for early identification. So developmental monitoring is something everyone can do. Teachers, daycare providers, um, mental health providers, allied health, pediatrician, teachers, parent, like everyone can do developmental monitoring. It doesn't require any special training. Really, you can just, you know, answer the questions and you can, um, you know, really monitor your own child's development. Where developmental screening, you have to have special training for. This is something that people like myself, allied health professionals, OTs, PTs, SLPs, teachers with specialized training can do screenings. Pediatricians do screenings, right? So, um, in Massachusetts, ages and stages is, is the big um, screening tool that's used most often. So the screening tool requires training where the monitoring doesn't. So let's get everyone in the community doing this monitoring to really help facilitate more screenings being done. I just want to provide like a brief example of so you can see the real difference between screening and monitoring. So when we're looking at developmental monitoring, one of the examples is um, at six months, babies begin to sit without support. When you hold the baby, um, they can stand on their legs when supported, and they begin to pass things from one hand to another, right? We call that transferring. So that's what a typical baby does at six months. On the developmental monitoring checklist, um, they always have this, you know, this little box here, talk to your doctor if right? And if your child isn't doing one of these things. And so at nine months, if the baby doesn't sit with help at nine months, they want you to go see the doctor. Or at nine months, if the baby doesn't bear weight on legs with support, they want you to go see the doctor. Or if the baby at nine months doesn't transfer toys from one hand to another, you're saying go see the pediatrician. If most of these skills on you, so if we look at all the checklists of all the things that we want you to do at six months, this is developmental monitoring. We're really keep in mind that this list of things that children can do is 75 to 90% of children can do that skill at six months, okay? So if 75 to 90% of children can sit without support at six months, and we're saying at nine months, go talk to the doctor. I want you to feel really confident that that's really late, okay? So you're not gonna have any unnecessary referrals. So this down here in this box, I have the Denver 2, which is a screening tool that a lot of occupational therapists use. And at 6.8 months, 75% of children can transfer an object from one hand to, to another. And 90% of children can do that at seven and a half months. So if we're not even referring children until nine months, then the skill is really, really delayed. And so this is why it doesn't require any extra training. This is, you know, everyone can do this. Parents can do this because this, the, the milestone that we're looking at, if it's a red flag, it's really late. Okay. And so that's really the difference between screening and monitoring. So when you ask a family to contact the pediatrician, you can feel confident that that 
that red flag, that checklist, it's really a delayed skill. And you can blame it all on the CDC, right? You, you don't have to say it's on you. You can say that, well, the CDC says you should really talk to your pediatrician if your child's not doing that yet. So it can really take that um, sort of ownership off you if you don't have good rapport with the family at first. You know, sometimes when the family first moves into town and you have a new child right away in your classroom, you might not have that rapport with the family. And so you might feel a little little bit uncomfortable making one of the first communications you have with the parent is, by the way, can you go see the pediatrician? So if you sometimes if you can put it on someone else, it sort of helps with that relationship. All right, so what are some of the tools that the CDC has? So I'm going to go through some of the tools, and these are all free. I did pop into Lawrence a couple weeks ago to drop off some materials, so I hope that you all um, got uh, to at least take a look at some of them, but they're all free online and parents can go onto the website and ask for them um, to be shipped to their house as well as the classroom teachers. So you can go right onto the Learn the Science Act Early website and um, put in an order for some materials. So let's go through some of these. These are some flyers here at the bottom. I have stacks of those. Um, these books are excellent, Amazing Me, Where is Bear? and the baby's busy day. So this is a one-year-old book, two-year-old book, three-year-old book. We have growth charts. There's a lot of different posters that people like to put up. This one right here um, with the sort of the map, the milestone map is a really popular poster. Um, and so we'll just sort of take a look at them individually. So this milestone booklet here, it comes in English and Spanish, and this is probably the most popular tool other than the app. This is really great for classroom teachers to have because it has everything in one place. So like in Puerto Rico, every baby that's born gets mailed home one of these booklets. Um, but working in early intervention, I found that parents really, um, it's hard for them to keep track of this over the years from birth to five. Um, and sometimes it might just sort of get tucked into that folder um, and not necessarily used that much. But I really like this for classroom teachers to have on hand to really refer um, to when um, you should be expecting certain milestones. Um, the checklists that are inside the milestone booklet are from two months to five years of age, and it has tons of activities for um, families to do at home. So it's a good way to um, provide quick recommendations, say there is a new babysitter or grandma's taking care of the children. This is a nice way to have age appropriate uh, recommendations for activities for parent engagement. Um, the milestone checklist, again, there's the four domains of development, and um, it'll have a list of activities, and then it will have uh, this, this box here, the checklist. So I like these printed checklists. So if you work in a classroom and you have all two-year-olds or all three-year-olds, you would only really need one checklist, and you could laminate it. And then when families come in, you could just use that with that child. Or you could, if you have a copier, you can print them off and then send them home with the families, and they can take them to the pediatrician. That's why I like the app because they will take their phone to the doctors. But um, these uh, these checklists here, I I print Spanish on the back side of mine because I work in the Springfield area and there's a, a large Spanish speaking population. So I have English on one side and Spanish on the other, um, and that's a really great communication tool for me. The um, on the CDC website, the checklists do come in Arabic, Brazilian, Portuguese, Haitian Creole. Chinese, Somali, Spanish, and Vietnamese. But as I said, I do have some other languages. If you're looking for one, please go ahead and email me. Um, the checklist again, you know, when we're looking for um, that the parents are coming in, this is just a really nice tool that you can use. It's sort of like a report card, right? Um, but as a communication tool, oh, I saw them do this. Have you seen this? It's a really nice icebreaker. So again, on the checklist, just really keep in mind that when we're saying, oh, did you do this, that 75 to 90% of the children are being able to do that skill. So if in that purple box, if it says if your child isn't doing this, please go see the doctor, it's because it's really late. Okay, so 
Just as a quick reminder, these checklists are not screening tools and they're not an indicator of developmental delay or disability that would require um, a delay or would require a full evaluation. So those of you that do screening, a screening just means you need an evaluation, right? So we did the monitoring and we're like, oh, this warrants a screen. And then, you know, then you have a more form formal screen and even that doesn't diagnose. That then refers for an evaluation. And out of that evaluation is when we can see a delay and a doctor can make a diagnosis. These tools, these developmental monitoring tools, the whole purpose is really about parental engagement. Okay, so what are the books? I love the books. All the books come in English and Spanish. Um, so this Baby's Busy Day is a board book. Um, so that's really nice for cleaning purposes. Um, again, comes in English and Spanish. But what I like about it is that they talk about uh, the milestones within the book. So the Where is Bear, a terrific tale for two-year-olds. Um, so when I was in Head Start on Thursday, yesterday, I had the English and Spanish side by side the book so I could point to the different animals and know what the words were. Um, so that was really like a bear was like Osito, I think. Um, so I had, this is an English book, but I had the Spanish right there next to it. So it was really helping me with my Spanish. Um, but inside the book, you can act out, right? So of course, I'm an OT with my gross motor, but you know, they, they hop and they blow and they, and they do all these activities that are milestones so the children can act them out. So that's really nice. And the same with, oh, I do have a Spanish one here. So, hmm. Donde esta Osito? It was Osito. And the Amazing Me book is a three-year-old book. And again, these are all free. If you go right on the website, you can try to print them, but unless you're incredibly gifted with a regular copying machine on how to fold it and turn it into a book, um, it's quite difficult. I tried and I did not have the skills um, to be able to print it out and then turn it into a book, but I'm sure some of you can figure that out. One of my favorite things um, within this program is the free continuing education program online. It's called Watch Me. There's four modules and it comes in English and Spanish, which is great. So there's just a button here. So you press this Spanish button and everything, all four modules, everything is in Spanish. So if you have, um, you know, what is your onboarding training for your facility? This would be a great thing to add. You know, we have like a, a HIPAA module and a universal precautions module. And can we just add this watch me module where it's part of the training process for anyone who's being hired in the Head Start site. So they learn about developmental monitoring right from the beginning. The course takes about 45 minutes to an hour, depending on how quickly you move through it. And then when you're done, it'll print you out a certificate of completion, which is really nice. Um, so I highly recommend this free training. It's really well done. Um, and the conferences that um, the Mass Act Early, um, we've been putting on until COVID once or twice a year, these, um, these conferences, this module is always shown during those conferences. All right, so online, there's also all these free tip sheets, and these are also in English and Spanish. So um, if you're concerned about development, you know, how do you talk to the doctor? This is a really nice one. Um, tips about talking to parents about developmental delays. So a lot of times, um, classroom teachers or new therapists, they, they feel uncomfortable having that conversation about the child's possible delay. So these are nice tip sheets on how you can um, bring that up. But there's also tip sheets um, specific to your role. So there's Head Start tip sheets, there's Home Visitor tip sheets, there's WIC tip sheets. Um, and so these tip sheets are, are, are very helpful. So I would um, check them out. I, I did some screenshots here. Um, so if this is the, when you Google Learn the Signs Act Early, this is the home page that will pull up. And when you scroll down, you'll see um, a list of things that you can click on. And so if you go to Early Childhood Educators, um, here we are, and there's a, there is a separate section just for Early Head Start and Head Start. So I would um, check that out when you have a minute. Um, some more of the materials are these, um, these growth charts, which are great for the classroom. They're very colorful. 
Um, again, there's these maps and there's these buttons that you can have for your website. So button is a new term I learned since becoming an ambassador. So um, instead of having just like a link, these are the things that it's a pretty picture and you click on it and it would take you right to the site. Um, so those of you who are not tech savvy like myself, button was a, a new term for me. And then of course the milestone tracker app, which is definitely the most common, commonly used tool. It's free. And you know, parents always have their phone with them, which is just really nice. And so later on in this presentation, um, I'm going to walk you through um, how to sort of enter in a child. Um, but I think that you'll find that this is definitely very user friendly and um, the parents really do like the app. Um, the tracker app has been updated with new colors. So if you put it on your phone, say a year ago and you haven't looked at it since, um, it has been updated. The app is nice because let's say for, for me, right? Like I'm an OT. If I make comments that I want the parent to remember to ask the pediatrician, they don't always remember, but I can put it right into their phone and the parent can then um, just show the pediatrician my notes right on their phone. And especially if there's a language barrier, that's especially nice, right? Because I can type comments right into um, the app. It's, it's just a really nice tool. All right, so let's talk about some of the Head Start standards and how you can incorporate these materials into the work that you're already doing because nobody needs more work. <laughs> That's for sure. So if we look at your education standards that you have, okay, here are some examples of the materials that you can use and then examples, right? So on your education, um, early Head Start student will receive a book according to the age range. So maybe if the child's one, they will receive the baby's busy day, which is the one-year-old book. And then the books will be part of the classroom home-based library. Or a milestone checklist or a booklet could be given and discussed with parents at every checkpoint parent conference. Another example would be um, the disabilities content area. And so possible um, activities that you could use materials might be the app, the checklist, the booklet, or the parent tip sheets. And an example might be you discuss the milestone using the app or the booklet during disability team meetings for referral and parent education purposes. The next category would be of health and the growth chart is a good um, material to use for that. And they can be given um, to enrolled early Head Start students in the home-based program to place in their home. And they will be placed in each early Head Start classroom to obtain required health um, and height data. The next example might be the ERSEA um, section, and we might use the um, the milestone app tracker flyer or the milestone moments booklet. So you recruitment material will include partnership with Learn the Science Act Early and provide the app flyer with recruitment material. Milestone moments booklet will be given to each parent in the enrollment process to assist with raising any developmental concerns. A uh, family service area, um, some examples might be to present uh, the Learn the Science Act Early project to parents, importance of milestones, you can pass out the booklet to everyone or ask them to download the app. And then for the family engagement nights, you could again present Learn the Science Act Early, you could talk about the importance of milestones, you could ask them to download the app or pass out a booklet. Um, one of the ambassadors actually reads the stories from the books with the parents together and then discusses the milestone from the book. And he's found that to be a really successful engagement tool. And lastly, the area of professional development, the Watch Me um, free online continuing ed program is awesome, right? You already have that. Um, and you could have all new Head Start staff um, watch the Watch Me program, um, or you could do um, a Learn the Signs Act Early presentation like today um, that you have saved somewhere in your files and new employees could watch that um, recorded presentation. All right, so I've been talking now for a half an hour straight at you and I have such a high pitched voice, I apologize for that. I do try to drop it down from my students where I teach. 
Um, but we're gonna go ahead and we are going to get our phones out and we are going to practice using the app. So please go ahead and pull up your app. And we are going to enter in a child. So the first thing that you're gonna do is you're gonna enter in the child's name and I'm gonna enter in Lucas. I'm gonna do this with you so that I am going at the speed that hopefully you are going at, okay? And we are gonna do Lucas's date of birth as February 25th, 2019. So please go ahead and enter in uh, this right onto your app. The next question is gonna be, was your child born premature? And we're gonna say no for this child. And then we're gonna say that Lucas is a boy. This is actually my cousin's baby in this picture right here. And then at the bottom, you're gonna hit done. And then a screen pops up and it says, Lucas is two years old. Does anyone want me to hold on a minute or are we all fine? Okay, so now that we have the screen that says Lucas is two years old, we're gonna scroll up and it says milestone checklist. So we're gonna click on that rectangle and we're gonna go through and, and complete a checklist so you can see actually how easy it is and how long it would, might take with a parent. So start tracking. So it's gonna ask a series of questions within each of the domains. So the first domain is social. Copies others, especially adults and older children. The choices are yes, not sure, or not yet. I'm gonna hit yes, and then I just scroll up. Gets excited with other children. I'm gonna say yes, and then I'm just gonna scroll up. Shows more and more independence, yes. And by the way, if you don't have your phone in front of you, if you're not sure what that is or you want the parent to look, there's a video for each of these to really demonstrate what the milestone is. Shows, oops, I just accidentally hit the video. Shows defiant behavior, for example, refuses to do what he is asked to do and will say yes, scroll up. Plays mainly besides other children, but is beginning to include other children such as in chase games, we'll say yes. And then we're gonna move on to the next section. And now we're in the language section. Points to, things, points to things or pictures when they are named, we'll say yes. Knows names of familiar people and body parts. Hmm, we're not sure about all the body, body parts. So we'll say not sure, and then we'll scroll up. Says sentences with two to four words. Not sure about four words there. So we'll say not sure and scroll up. Follows simple instructions, we'll say yes. Repeats words overheard in conversation, we'll say yes. Points to things in a book, we'll say yes. And now we're on to the next section and we're on the cognitive section. Finds things even when hidden under two to three covers. So we're looking for object permanence there and we'll say yes. Begins to short sort shapes and colors, we'll say yes. Complete sentences and rhymes in familiar books. Mm, we'll say not sure on that one. Play simple make-believe games, we'll say yes. Build a tower of four more blocks, we'll say yes. Might use one hand more than the other, we'll say yes, looking for hand dominance. Follows two-step directions, such as pick up your shoes and put them in the closet, we'll say yes. Names, items, and a picture book, we'll say yes. And now we're on to the last section, which is the movement. So stands on tiptoe, yes. Kicks a ball, yes. Begins to run, yes. Climbs onto and down from furniture without help, we'll say yes. Walks up and down stairs holding on, we'll say yes. Throws ball overhand, we'll say yes. Makes or copies straight lines. Oh, in circles, we'll say yes. And now we're on to the next section. So we've completed the checklist. So remember on the checklist, there's this um, column 
with all the things that they should be doing at this age. But then there's this checklist of if you're this box, right? If your child isn't, isn't doing this, go see the pediatrician. And so we've just completed the checklist and now we're on that box of if your child doesn't do this, go see the pediatrician, okay? So we're not gonna check anything unless the child can't do it. So if the child is missing milestones, if the child doesn't know what to do with common things like a fork, doesn't copy actions or words, doesn't follow simple instructions, doesn't use two word phrases like drink milk, doesn't walk steadily, or loses skills he once had. Well, that doesn't fit our child here. So now we're not gonna check any of those and we're just gonna hit my child's summary. And now this summary, we've just completed the checklist as if we did it on a piece of paper. And this summary can be emailed to anyone you want. It can be emailed to the parent's home email account. It can be emailed the parent, it can be emailed to the parent and then the parent can choose again to email it to the doctor. So we could choose where we want this summary to go. Um, it gives a nice, and you can also click once you're done, let's say you did the whole thing in English, you could click Spanish and it would then, let's say I speak English, but the parents speak Spanish, I could complete it in English and then show the summary to the parent in Spanish. So it's just really nice and it only takes a minute. So I hope you all were able to follow along um, with that. So now that we have this completed checklist, I'll just give everyone a minute just, just in case, but if, you, if you've already, if you were able to follow along with me, what are three activities, right? So where do you find the activities that were all in the book? We talked about how the book has all these wonderful age appropriate activities. Well, where do you find those on the app? Right? So fool around a little bit and try to find them. See if you can. Does anyone know how to find it? Under the three bars. Under the hamburger, right? Under the three bars. Perfect. Thank you, Heather. So if you click the three bars, which is in the top left, there's a, um, an, um, a subheading that's tips and activities, and then it gives age appropriate activities. Wonderful. Okay, so that only took eight minutes, right? And I was kind of going a little bit slow. So um, it could be done much faster than that. So I just wanted to um, sort of let you see how that works. Okay, so moving along. I really wanna emphasize that all of you play a really important role in the child's development. So the classroom that I work in right now, um, it's a migrant community classroom, and the two teacher's assistants are both fluent in Spanish. They work so hard, and the kids love them so much. They adore those children, and the children adore them right back. Like Think of that bond. These parents are working all day, and so these, the teachers are spending way more time with the children than the parents get to. And so think of how much that the, the teachers, you all, think of how much observation time that you have with those children versus working parents who you get your home, your child home at night and you have to feed them, you might bathe them, um, you know, maybe you want to try to read a story, um, but they're pretty tired after school. And, you know, my mom used to call it the witching hour, but like between 4.30 and 5.30, younger children get kind of cranky, right? And so parents aren't always getting their children at their best times during the week. And so teachers spend so much time with the children. You really have a much better idea a lot of the times of the child's development and their concerns and what their strengths and weaknesses are in this developmental domain. Um, than the parents do. So really give yourself that credit, that, that self-worth of you really are important and your understanding of child development is important for you to communicate to the families because they might not understand that their child really should be doing this, right? Um, we can't take it for granted that um, any parent would really know the milestones, right? Because if you don't work in this field, how are you supposed to know, you know, when children are supposed to cut with a knife, right? And so I think it's really important that 
as um, you know, people who work with children that we really understand how important our role is and really make sure that we advocate for the children to get them what they need. Because I just don't think that parents that don't work in this area really understand how important it is to get the services that they need. Okay, so making a referral. So we always want to keep the pediatrician in the loop, right? So if you're making a referral for to early intervention or special ed or in Massachusetts, we have family ties, which is so wonderful. We also always want to include the pediatrician, okay? So definitely reach out to your ped pediatrician, but also here is the number for the local EI. Here is the number for special ed if they're, you know, 2.9 years, or um, let's just say they're moving let's give them family ties because, you know, they're moving. I'm not sure where they're going to go, but just stay in touch with family ties and family ties will keep you where you wanted to go, right? So when I worked in Lee Elementary um, in Boston Public Schools, that was a very, it had the highest um, homeless rate of children in Massachusetts. And so, you know, if you have a family that is, is one of those families that moves around a lot, family ties might be the best option there. So um, just really keep that in mind that we do have different referral options, but no matter what, we are always supposed to at least tell them to go to the pediatrician, whether they have one or whether they do or not. Okay, so if you don't already know about Family Ties, hopefully you all do, but it is this amazing resource that we have here in Massachusetts, and they are just the best. Um, I am having some booklets made for the grant I just got, and I'm going to put Family Ties information right on the back. So if you have developmental concerns, contact Family Ties. So hopefully I'll be having a lot of these made within the next year. Um, but they not only will help families, but they also have, um, let's say respite. So I work in special ed, like respite care is so hard for families to find. You cannot even imagine how hard it is to find quality, um, responsible, respite care where the person stays at the same job for like more than a year. So it's so hard for, pa for families to, you know, go out. Um, if like my friends, they have a child, they, she, they can't go out to eat. Um, she's 17. Um, they just can't, they can't, it's just not a fun environment. They can't fly on a plane. Um, there's a lot of things that they just can't do and they can't find quality respite. Like they just, they can't. So that's just so upsetting. So Family Ties is an organization that will help you find respite. They'll help you find, let's say you have a child with Down syndrome, they'll help you find the local support group for children with Down syndrome. So it's not just that they'll give you the right um, EI phone number for that catchment area, that zip code, right? They do way more than just that. So if you're not familiar with Family Ties, definitely go on their website or call, or if you're just, again, not sure what to tell the family, just tell them to call Family Ties and they will take care of it. It's a parent advocacy group and it's just, um, it's so wonderful. I, I can't speak highly enough. Okay, so a little bit back to empowering families because I talked a little bit, you know, I hinted at the fact that sometimes when even when a parent brings a concern to a pediatrician, they're not always heard, um, which can be really upsetting for parents. Um, I think I mentioned I'm a feeding specialist and I'll recommend things to families and then they come back and they're getting nowhere with the pediatrician and they're so upset. And I just think it's really important that we, um, we just continue to be that support system for the families and help them to continue to advocate for their child, right? And one of the big things here in Massachusetts, which is not in all states, is that we don't have to have a pediatrician referral for EI. We don't have to have that. I was in Virginia when I had my two. I couldn't get a referral to EI. I couldn't get one. My pediatrician was not hearing me at all. I was talking and talking and talking. The first one wouldn't eat. Oh yeah, he had a feeding disorder. I didn't know that. And I work in pediatrics. I had no idea. My pediatrician, he's fine. He's gaining weight. He's fine. He's fine. He ate less than 10 foods. Don't even get me started, right? Not being heard. And my second one wasn't making any sounds. I couldn't get a speech referral. He's fine, he's fine. He wasn't fine. I ended up just like badgering over her, her over the head. She finally gave me a referral 
to outpatient services when I wanted was EI. So I had to call the doctor's office back and get the EI. I don't want to go, I don't want to go to a hospital for my services. I want someone coming into my home. But I'm an educated white woman who is demanding this and not getting it. So imagine some of our families that English is very hard for them, right? So if a, you know, middle-class white woman who speaks good English can't get the pediatrician to listen to me or validate my concerns, imagine what some of our families are going through. It's crazy. Anyways, can you tell I get a little fired up about that? But so what we can do um, working with children is just really support the parents, keep them being engaged, advocating for the children, and know that, you know what, parents are most of the time, 90% of the time, they're right. If there's a concern, 90% of the time, the family is dead on that there is a concern. So when we hear pediatricians, oh, we'll take that wait and see approach, we don't have to do that in Massachusetts, right? We don't have to. We don't have to take the wait and see as long as the family knows that they can go right to EI, they can go right to special ed, they can get an evaluation. And here's the thing, people ask me all the time, I am not a physician, <laughs> I have my doctorate in OT, but it's amazing people ask me these questions all the time. I'm like, if you're concerned, go get evaluated. They're not gonna give you services if your child doesn't need them. Insurance won't pay for them if it's outpatient and the government's not gonna pay for them either if you're getting something like EI. If your kid doesn't need them, they won't qualify. So if you have a concern, go get them tested, just go. It's really, it's really that simple. This is what I say to everyone. So please feel free to borrow this for anyone that you know. If someone comes to you, because if you work with children, somehow you become the expert in your family, right? So you're a teacher in preschool three to five, you become like the developmental expert. <laughs> so people ask you questions, just get them tested. Just like, go, go find out if it's not a big deal. And there could be a wait list. But if you have a speech concern and you're trying to get like an outpatient speech therapy evaluation, it could be a nine month wait list. So again, like don't wait. If the families have concerns, get them evaluated. They don't need services, they're not gonna get them. All right, any questions on that? All right. We are gonna try baby number two on our app, but this time the baby's going to be premature. So, Grab your phone, pull up your app again, and we're gonna add a new child. So if you hit the child's name at the top, if you still have Lucas showing and you hit the arrow next to Lucas, it'll say add child. If you didn't like look it up and start from the beginning. And if I forgot to mention, because I've already been in my app several times, but if you don't have the app, the app comes in English and Spanish. So this is really nice for a lot of families that you can be doing yours in English and they can be doing it right in Spanish. So we're gonna add another child. This is one of my students' babies. So cute. I'm always asking for pictures of people's kids that I can use for my presentation. So if you've got some cuties, Please send them along um, and with permission for me to, to use them. Okay, so this baby's name is Jordan. So we're going to enter in Jordan and her date of birth is December 6, 2020. And now it's gonna say, what's your child premature? And this time we're gonna say yes. And how many weeks? We're gonna say five, five weeks. And then this is a girl. So we scroll up and we hit done. So Jordan is nine months old. But if we look at what checklist we're on, we're on the six month checklist because the app is correcting for the prematurity, okay? So as an occupational therapist, I correct until the child's two. So all of the assessments that I use I correct for prematurity until age two. So I'm not sure what your rules are in early Head Start for your assessments, but all the ones that I use, all my standardized tests, correct until age two. So um, that's, just, that's just my point of view on that. I think it's really important to correct. Um, 
When a child is in between a checklist, let's say the child is seven months and there's a six month checklist and a nine months checklist, you would always use the younger checklist. So let's say the child is 11 months. There's not an 11 month checklist. You either have to use the nine months or the one year. You're gonna use the nine month checklist. So no matter what the age of the child is, if there isn't the exact age that you are, you're gonna go down a checklist. Okay, back to Jordan on our app here. So even though J Jordan is nine months, we're going to use the six month checklist because we're correcting for age, which is a really nice feature on the updated one that was not on the first app. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna add in an appointment because this is one of my favorite features of the app especially being EI and saying, I'm coming next week, please don't forget. And please make that child hungry because I'm the feeding therapist. Okay. <laughs> All right, so if you scroll down and you hit add appointment at the bottom, you can type in. So let's say like where I'm working now, they have a parent meeting on Thursday nights. This next Thursday, they have a parent meeting. So when the parent's here, you can put it right on their phone and they're gonna get a reminder. You know, you get one of those notifications on your app that there's a parent meeting, which is so nice. So we're just going to type in the appointment meeting. We'll say parent meeting. And we can put the date right in there. And I'm just using next Thursday because that's the head start where I'm at. They have parent meeting next Thursday at 7. And the time is at 7 p.m. And if you, wow, this is taking me a while. If you don't delete this when we're done, then you're gonna get these notifications on your phone. So you can really see how, how kind of nice it is. Oh, I did want to mention, so my students, we go into the Springfield Head Start and my students um, speak with the families in the waiting room about the app and teach them about it. And sometimes um, families are concerned about their legal status of being in the country. And it's really important to explain that this information isn't saved anywhere. It's not being fed to anyone. Um, and if they're still not comfortable, you can delete it. So I have them take an iPad. If they don't want to put it on their phone, you can just put in the first name and you can make the, say the birthday off by just a couple days. And you can write when they're done, you can see it just deleted off. Right, to sort of give that extra level of comfort if you have a family that you think is gonna be concerned um, that they, uh, about their status. So for the provider name, you can put in Kate or whoever you like, questions, concerns. So for me, for EI, I'm always like, please have the child hungry. <laughs> um, but you could put like that it's a Zoom meeting and you can, and the notes, you could put, um, you know, the meeting ID number right in there. So it's all in one spot. So this is a, and, oh, and you, but you have to hit add appointment at the bottom. So after you have in all um, the required information, you have to hit add appointment. And then it's in there. You know, the parent meeting is right in their phone. It's just a really nice feature. Um, if they have, um, you know, a follow-up at the doctor's or an IEP, like a disability team is getting together, you can put all this information right into the phone for them, um, which is really helpful. Okay, so one more thing that we are going to try on the phone is the when to act early section. So if you look up here, we're on Jordan and um, we completed a milestone checklist on Lucas. Um, some of you found the tips and activities, oops, See, I, this is what I normally do at the bottom. EI feeding specialist coming with the date and time. But this button right here, when to act early. Let's say you only have a hot minute with the family. Let's go ahead and find that screen with that red dot and we're just going to hit the when to act early. So what we're doing now is we're skipping the whole checklist, right? This is like a quick, okay. <laughs> And we're just doing, if you can't do this, call the pediatrician box, okay? So if you hit that when to act early, that's what you're doing. So we're gonna go ahead and, and click that. So now it says, is missing milestones. So I'm talking to 
Jordan's father came along, right? I barely know this family. And Jordan's dad said, Jordan's not rolling over, okay? And she doesn't show any affection towards the dad and he's really concerned. Ooh, okay, let's go to the when to act early and I'm gonna look at what the things are because you know, when is a kid supposed to roll? I don't know, let's take a look. Is missing milestones? I'm not sure. Doesn't try to get things that are in reach. I don't know, that's not what he said. Shows no affection for caregivers. Oh, that's what Jordan Thuds just said. I'm gonna check that, okay? Doesn't respond to sounds around her, has difficulty getting things to mouth, seems very sloppy, floppy, sorry, like a rag doll, doesn't make bowel sounds, doesn't roll over in either direction, okay? So rolling over should happen by six months. So we are gonna check that the child doesn't roll over and then we're gonna hit my, my child's summary, okay? So again, this can be emailed um, but let's, for practicing purposes, let's hit the show doctor button that comes up. And so this can, this can just go to the doctor. Like, it's just really nice. And you, you don't have to take that ownership, especially when you don't really know the families that well. You can just really put the ownership on the CDC. You know, um, the CDC has a lot of weight. I started using that title when I'm calling people and like, you know, oh, this is Dr. Kate Barlow from AIC. I get nothing. This is Kate Barlow. I'm the CDC's Act Early Ambassador. I get a, you know, oh, hold on a minute. Like it just carries extra weight, um, which is really nice. So just take it off yourself, right? If the CDC is saying, please go ahead and contact the pediatrician. All right, so here is Jordan, okay? How do we find from where we are now, how you get to the six month milestone overview, right? So it has this nice um, sort of divides things, social, language, cognitive movement, right? How do we get to that overview from the page where we are now? Anyone able to find it? So remember that hamburger, right? The, the little hamburger sign here? That's how we're gonna find the milestone overview. So you might have to scroll up or you might have to hit the back um, arrow and that's gonna take you back to the menu once you can see that hamburger sign. And why this is really important is because I feel like a lot of times we're looking at social, emotional and language. So if you really just want to know what a six month old should be doing for the language skills, you can just hit the language and you're just going to get the language skills or the social skills. But let's say it was movement, right? You can hit the movement and you're just going to see um, what concerns there are just in the movement domain. So that's a really nice feature if you just want one area to quickly view. Um, I do love the tips and activities um, because, you know, uh, my students like to use it for treatment planning, but let's say you have um, a new teacher assistant that's new to working with children. Um, here's a whole bunch of activi activities that you can do with a three-year-old, right? Um, so it's, it can be used in a lot of ways, not just with engaging, with engaging parents. All right, so here are some takeaways from, uh, from really what's most important here about early identification. So $1 spent in preschool saves $8 later in special education. So one of the things that I think people listen to is money. So why is what we're doing so important is because it saves the tax dollars a ton of money when we can identify children as early as possible. I feel like this is really uh, clear when we're looking at speech therapy. So I finally did get that script for speech therapy for my second son. And he started therapy at 18 months and he was discharged on his two-year-old birthday. So he started in January. He made no sounds. His behaviors were horrendous because he couldn't communicate. And then he was discharged by his uh, second birthday, which was in August because he got it so early. He only needed six months. Now, if I had waited until that child was like three, I probably would have needed a year or two. 
at least, probably a year and a half to two and a half years at least of speech therapy. So the earlier that we can intervene and get children the services they need, usually the less services they need, um, but the better outcomes for the child, right? Um, if we think about why we have Title V, right? We're always trying to catch up kids and we want them all caught up before third grade, right? We're trying to give kids as much um, intervention as we can to catch them up by third grade. Well, if we're identifying them in the birth to three population, how great is that? Why are we waiting until they're three? So learn the signs, act early is really, the, as soon as we can identify kids, the better. And it's really about the kids, right? That's why you all work at Head Start, because it's all about the kids. Another takeaway about today is that a doctor's referral is not required in Massachusetts. And one of the, the ambassador for Hawaii is actually a pediatrician and he is floored by this. And he is like, what do you mean? You don't need a doctor's referral. Can I get that for Hawaii? I'm like, I don't even know how that happened in Massachusetts, but it is real, okay? So we're really lucky here in Massachusetts that we don't need the doctor's referral. So you know what? If the child isn't doing something and you know, we're saying, yes, call the pediatrician, let the pediatrician know, but you can go ahead and give that referral right to EI. And I'm sure you all have like your sort of favorite EI, um, you know, group by where you are. Um, that is usually the case. And that's great. Make both referrals, right? We're only, we're only doing the child a favor if we just communicate as much as possible to try to get that child evaluated. All right, and children with developmental delays, the earlier they receive services, the less services they need. Okay, so thank you all so much for listening to me go on and on and on, but I reserved a bunch of time for questions here, um, especially about how you can implement this and, and what you're already doing. If you have any questions, you can email me. This is my email, and I will try to get back to you as soon as possible. Um, these presentations that I do are at no cost to anyone. This is part of my ambassador job. So I am happy to try to get everyone using the program because guess what? I look good when people are using the program. So they actually like um, track how many people download the app. And they also track how many people um, certificates go out for the Watch Me program, how many people are using that. And they somehow, I don't even know how this works, of course, they know when it happens in Massachusetts. So when I say I'm free, like I'm free because I like this job, I'd like to keep it. So the more people that are using Learn the Signs Act early, the better my chances are staying in this role. So please email me if you have any questions um, because I'm really gonna be happy to answer them for you. Just a quick, um, how to stay current um, for the CDC. They have, so this Milestones Matter Facebook page is really the CDC's Learn the Signs Act Early Facebook page, um, but it's called Milestones Matter. But the um, sort of like the interns that work for the CDC and the Learn the Signs Act Early, they run that Milestones Matter and they do really great posts. I, however, do not do a lot of great posts, but I and Dr. Rula Shiruli do the Mass Act Early uh, Facebook page, and I, I try to do one post a week, um, but we're not great about it. But we do post all of the free trainings or any trainings in the state, and the trainings that we do are usually twice a year, and they are um, at no cost or very low cost. So the one that we did pre-COVID was like $25 at UMass Amherst for an all day continuing ed conference. And the one we were supposed to do at Bristol Community College in April got canceled because of COVID, but that was supposed to be free. I am doing a continuing ed all day conference in January that will be free and it's being advertised to Head Start WIC and EI and I will email this information. Um, but it's an all day and you will hear some of the same information in the beginning. It's the first hour is about Learn the Signs Act early, but then the second hour is really taking a deep about referrals, um, um, the difference between monitoring, screening, and evaluation. And I sort of pull up some examples. The third hour is about um, my, the third, yeah, about um, developmental milestones are two hours. And then the last is about attachment and complex trauma in children. And so if you are interested in that, if you do all um, five hours, you will get free 0.5 CEUs. So that is part of the grant coming around. 
and I will make sure you get that email. And then this Mass um, Act Early website right here, we also make posts about um, free or low cost um, webinars. And there's also a lot of free webinars on there already. So we did a free online conference last November because of COVID. Um, so it was all online and it was free. And all of those webinars are on the um, Mass Act Early website until November. So, and we had a really, oh my, she was amazing. We had this um, speech language pathologist who has her PhD present on um, augmentative communication. It was really amazing. So we, we paid for her to present through the grant and, and that one is, is really wor worth watching. So please go ahead and check that out. And that's it. So thank you all for listening so much. Um, let's talk about questions. Does anyone have any questions?